Gig Gab, episode 231 for Monday, October 28th, 2019. folks and welcome to gig gab the show by for and about working musicians here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in san jose california paul kent two weeks in a row where we're both in the same location not not that we're in like we're not together but we are each in the same location we were a week prior that's not a bad thing it's like no, consistent it's fall right it's time to settle in get some stuff done <sighs> get ready for the holidays you already have any holiday gigs booked? Uh, I have a, that's a good question. Um, we have, uh, we were supposed to have a New Year's Eve gig booked, but our singer in Uptown, this is one of those, those things, right? Uh, he had something else booked, which no one can be upset at him about. Like Uptown, you know, Gary went through sort of a period getting his restaurant straight where we really weren't booking much at all. So Marty wound up booking something else, which was fine. So we definitely don't want to do the gig without him. Mm. So we don't have a new year's gig for that. We do. I, so I then took a Rocky horror gig. So yes, I have a gig on Christmas day at like 10 PM Rocky horror and then new year's Eve uh, <laughs> Rocky horror. So yeah, I've got those, those gigs booked. And then we've got a monkey fist gig on the, I think the 24th, first that's a kind of a christmas thing and so yeah there's a couple sort of peppered peppered in throughout there how about you i've got it i signed a, a new year's eve gig uh, about three months ago so we've known about that one for a while i just got my first corporate christmas party and uh we had a date on hold and that was a december saturday night we had another and i i very consciously don't book club dates on in uh from the middle of november yeah. out you know, assuming that this stuff is going to come in. And some years it comes in, some years it doesn't come in. Um, so I've got one, I've got a hold on another date and I've got a new year's Eve gig, but I sure hope we're going to see more. It seems like they're booking later and later though. It seems, you know, it used to be that the big companies they used to start planning their, you know, cause they have to reserve a place and they used to start planning these way farther in advance. It seems like every year it gets a little bit, at least out here with Silicon Valley companies, it seems like every year it gets a little bit, no, I'm finding that too. Close it's, friend. you know, like weddings certainly book way, way out. You, I mean, usually, right. But um, the corporate gigs, like the one we played a corporate gig, I actually have a couple of stories to tell about it from uh, with Uptown on Friday night. And I mean, like that gig, I don't think was even on the books before October 1st. So that wasn't, you know, October 25th was the date of the gig or whatever. And like, so it was, you know, two to three weeks out. And then we declined one. Uh, a similar type of gig for uh, November 8th. And that just happened, you know, end of last week. And so that was another mm -hmm. two to three weeks kind of thing. So that that's, yeah, that's abnormal for, for this band. Like in the past with Uptown, it, the, like, you know, we, you, you and I talked about kind of having that, that 30 day out policy, you know, as a one way to sort of mitigate the scheduling issues with a band, the people that, right. you know, play in multiple projects or whatever. And that would have totally worked with Uptown. Like not, you, you wouldn't have even had to say anything. Like, it's just like, oh yeah, if it's a month out, oh, there's definitely nothing coming on the calendar. Well, that's not so much the case these days, but yeah. So it seems to be um, at least bi-coastal, the, uh, the phenomenon that uh, you're finding. So I agree. Yeah. And then we have, yeah, I, we have a good question from Sean that we'll get to later in the show too, about making initial contact with a club. So I want to, this is a good one, but we've got some, question. we've got some experiential stories to tell first and we like to get those out of the way up front. So. Yeah. So I've got um, a coffee this afternoon with a, a guy in another band. It's a great band, but in all the years they've been around maybe even a little bit longer than the house rockers have. And we know, I know the guys in that band and friendly with them. We've probably only done one or two or three dates together over the years, but, you know, very copacetic. They're good guys, you know, the really good band, uh, classic rock, um, fun, uh, called the Megatones. And I called up one of the guys, actually I messaged him and I said, Hey, as I've shared here, my club life is going to change next year. So I'm looking at a few things. You guys play a club that, you know, I'm 
curious if we would be good for that club. Yeah. Now that question in and of itself, depending upon who you're talking to, can be met with all sorts of say, responses, without, right? Without, but I knew this guy was yeah. good enough of a guy that I could ask this question. And yeah. the way I asked it was, do you think it would be a good place for us? What a right? great way to ask that question, though. I mean, like, you're right, because that question can be totally loaded. It can be seen as, uh, you know, as someone being over aggressive, trying to, you know, move in on your turf, so to speak. Right. right? But but when you've got a trust relationship and and you know that the question's coming from a good place, there still is the tact of finding a way to ask that question. And by putting it on them and saying, hey, do you think we'd be good for that place? If they want to say, no, you know, I don't I, like nah, that place is weird, like you're too big or, the, you know, whatever, like they could easily ease their way out of that conversation without it being awkward or anyone needing to save face or anything like that. That's but it's all about being cool, kind of like that conversation we had, yeah. you know, about talking about other band members. It's all just about, hey, you know, I don't want to just sh- there's a guy I know who comes to gigs that I do. And he never comes to a gig truly just to enjoy the music. There's always an angle. It's there's, you know, there's always a, you know, whether he uses his relationship with me and or us uh, to start a conversation with a venue, you know, booker. And he has that reputation as of always having an angle. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to, you know, yep. show up. You know, but, you know, all of a sudden I'm on the same schedule as another band when they know me. And again, I don't think they would expect that I owed them the conversation or anything like that. But this is a good way to kind of demonstrate good intent and open doors for things like if you have to swap gigs or, or sub gigs or anything like that. Totally. You know, this it totally builds a bridge for future conversations. And like I said, we already have we, now we're not close. I wouldn't say that, you know, we hang out together, but we are friendly. Right. Yeah. And then this makes it this makes it copacetic. So we respect each other. Yeah, that's it. And so um, we're going to have coffee this afternoon. Actually, the, the point of this whole story is I sent him a note saying, do you think we would be good for this venue? And he said, well, what's going? Oh, actually, I said my my club situation is changing for next year. Well, do you think we'd be good for this venue? And he said, yeah, let's talk about it. What's going on? So I kind of shared with him some of the things that are changing and, you know, kind of let him see under the kimono, so to speak, a little bit. And um, he said, why don't we sit down? <laughs> if he's for- listening now, he may want not want coffee today, but that's okay. <laughs> he said, why don't we sit down and compare notes? We've been through this a lot of times. And, you know, I know we all know the same guys, but let's just kind of talk about what we can what we can do. And you know, this is going to do a few things. One, it's going to get me the basic information that I'm asking for. If there's one particular club yeah. that I'm interested in, you know, if my big band will fit on their stage, if my style of music is good, you know, for the type of clientele that they have locally, all, you know, all that type of stuff. Also, it'll deepen that relationship a little bit for things like, you know, having to swap gigs if you ever need to, referrals of gigs if they if you, you know. So few band leaders do this, you know, sometimes you refer to just a guy, you know, in another band, but who do you really set up strategic relationships with that are, that are, you know, people that you like referring stuff to people that it's not, you know, wasted time to explore some problem solving things. Yeah. Uh, Even, even to that point of, you know, can, if I, if I'm short a musician, you know, is this, is this someone who I would want to go, go to, or would they feel comfortable coming to me? So, or coming to my guys, I guess I should say. (laughs) So, um, but no, that like, there, that is a valuable type of relationship to have, because if you do wind up in a scenario, you know, like we've got a, a monkey fist gig, gig coming up that I think we need to punt on because we don't have monkey fist. There's a few guitar players that we can use and it's fine, but um, nah, you know, we can't get any of them. One of, you know, all, all of them, but one was booked and, and that was fine and put them on the bill and everything's good. And then, just yesterday he had to bail out because of, yep. you know, something going on in his life. And it's like, OK, fine. But now we know we don't have anybody left like the we're, we're done on the on the roster here, you know. And so, like, we need to make a phone call and say, can we you know, can we get somebody else in and having those relationships yep. with other acts just to know that you can call the club and say, hey, I'm really sorry. Here's what happened. Uh, but I've solved the problem if you mm-hmm. want this other band. Now, the club may say, no, thank you. But at least you're delivering a potential solution to them as opposed to saying, hey, sayonara later, you know. And so that can exactly. be a really valuable thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, potential solutions are good. And you're right. Sometimes a club owner will be, nope, this is a good opportunity for me to give somebody else a shot who's been calling me all the time. Or sometimes you're like, I trust you. And, you know, we've worked up this level of trust with each other. Thanks. I don't got to think about this. You know, let's all go on with our life. Yep. But it is I I do. I caution people, you know, that that potential solution is the is the key there because you don't want to promise the gig to the other band. It's are you available? If so, I will yes. recommend you when I tell them. And if you explain it the right way, everybody will understand. Oh, of course. Like it's not actually up to you to book that band, you know, That's book right. the band for the night. It's just it is not it is not your owned slot. It is not your own slot. It is yours uh, un- un- unless and until you into their slot. Right. You've booked into their slot. That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. So the other thing cool. I want to tell you about was. Uh, it's a little weird out here right now uh, with these fires that are going on around California, especially Northern California. And certainly Friday night where there were and Saturday night where there were a lot of kind of pre Halloween events at clubs. Um, power actually went out in clubs, you know, so pg e has been a little cagey. So pg is a local power company has been a little cagey. They kind of give you a forewarning that you might be subject to a power outage. Right? Well, I experienced some of this when you. I was out there um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, where I was, was not in the warned area, but I was like in the eye of the storm. Everything around me was in this, like, we don't know if we're going to have power. I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Cool. Yeah. So, so some clubs full of people in costume, having a good time, um, got subject to this. And I saw a bunch of bands. One, Two friends of mine were doing an acoustic gig at a, at a golf course. Power went out. They lost their PA. They just gathered everybody around and did a did an acoustic show. Some places the shows ended, you know, if it was right at midnight that the, that the power went out. Sure. Acoustic Madness had a gig. We haven't had a gig in a while. Um, and it was so good to play with Mary Ellen and Steve again. We had a gig, an afternoon gig at a winery that we love. We just love the venue. Uh, um, we just love the crowd that comes out. It's really, really one of the more fun things we do. And they called us the day before and said, power might be out. Will you do a pure acoustic show? And we were like, eh, you know, I don't think that's a good idea because really, you know, probably about 125 to 150 people come to this. The people right in front of us will be able to hear. And that's the people it. one row back all the way to the back will get bored and start talking. And then we'll be having to sing over that. And so it's just, that's not a good, that doesn't, that's good, not good representation of our brand. It's not a good experience for anybody listening. So I would prefer not to do that. And they were like, well, you know, let's stay in touch. But in the meantime, we chatted as a band and um, we decided to, you know, get our own um, generator to bring with us, yeah. which I guess these things are, you know, pretty much consumer products. Now you can get, you know, pretty simple ones between a hundred and 200 bucks. And, you know, they're, they, they can go far enough away and they run on gas for a real long time. You know, so that's not an issue. They provide enough power, get a long extension cord. You can get the hum of the generator out of the way. And so we did that. And while their tasting room was in the dark, you know, they were operating by candlelight. We were doing a full show and it was just great. And again, it was so nice to see Steve and Mary Ellen. They've been so busy. Our little group used to play three or four times a, a month. Yeah. And we, I think we only, we're, if we do, have done four shows in the last six months, that would be a bit. We did one private and that, but it was just good to see them. Um, you know, and they're great. And they remind me, you know, that is the least intense situation. I don't lead that band. Mm. It's really, that's, that's a kind of a democracy. We just show up and, and play. They're great. And I always learn something musically by just being around them. And I just love their performance and their, that's and awesome. their singing styles. Yeah. So it's just a good thing. Uh, Steve is actually doing something really kind of interesting. So he has a duo partner that is a listener of gig gab. And I'm just going to throw a, uh, a little praise there. They put together another one of these tribute shows. So I've done Springsteen and Petty. Mary Ellen has done through two Ron set shows and Steve did a Fogarty show. And now Steve's singing partner has put together a great band, a couple of house rockers in it to do um, a Paul Simon tribute and oh. really tackling Tackling some difficult stuff. I was I was uh, hanging out with the bass player was playing on that, and he was saying like, "You don't realize that the best of the best of bass players have played for Paul Simon over oh, the years." That, well, that's the, it's the same with drummers. Man. It's the same with everybody, yes. right? Like that those tunes when somebody throws like, "Oh, what do you guys think? You want to do like you know Fifty Ways or late in the evening?" And it's like, <laughs> uh, "Okay, you know my blood pressure just goes up a notch." Exactly. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah, so that's it's not great. taking care of business. <laughs> it ain't TCB, man. No. I mean, some yeah. of the songs are, 
you know, but but it, but there's so many nuances to those things because well, even the stuff you know by heart, like Nick is playing piano for it, and he said, you know, bridge over troubled water is that is and Nick is a guy who has to if you ask him to learn a part he will learn the part yeah. and he is really stressing you know to get into the nuance and emphasis and style and tactics of this and but you know all the players are, are great a players they've had a couple of rehearsals again these are kind of you know you balance them between how much workload you give the guys to do yep. and you know needing to accomplish something but the word is it's going to be a pretty special show so I wish those guys a lot of luck I know it'll be super and um, I think he's already sold it out Nice. Which is, again, it's a good thing. And it goes again to kind of prove that point that there are other channels to deliver great music besides bars. Yeah, totally. It's really important to think about that here. Here we have people with money and we have wineries and we have all that type of stuff. But I would hasten to say there's many people in all demographics who either want to listen to music or sing along with music or just consume music, let it wash over them. And, you know, I think it's kind of probably, I know here it's been an underdeveloped channel, right? So I did it because I just wanted to experience that music. And that's why all the artists are doing it. But what you're finding, like with the great reception to ticket sales, to all these types of things that a, you have, you do have fans. If you've been out there, people are now attached to you and want to see what you have to do as an artist. But B, if it's a good idea, there, there, there are many people in most markets, whether it's a coffee shop to just go out and listen and relax or whether it's a, you know, a small concert venue. If you do it right and provide that experience, you know, a night out for 10, 15, 20 bucks to go hear good music and really just be entertained is definitely something people will pay for. Yeah. All right. So uh, we, we, you like steamrolled through like three different topics and I have a couple uh, of things to say. Sorry. No, 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 it's totally fine. You were like on a roll and I, I'm like, okay, as I just make my notes, you know, I learned a long time ago. I could try to interrupt. No, I mean, it's not you actually. I learned this even before we started doing this show. I keep a pen and paper by my desk here while we're talking. And so I can like, Oh, if I have a thought, I write it down and then I can still be listening to you. Not trying to remember what I, uh, what I, isn't the worst feeling in the world when you tell yourself to make a mental note. And by the time you go to get that note, whether it's five seconds, five minutes, five hours later, it's gone. Isn't that the, like the most, it's hapless feeling in the world. The worst is that I have solved this problem here for the podcast, you know, cause I, cause uh, because of that, I just write it down. The worst is I know I've solved it here. And when I'm playing, I can't write it down because like, yes. my hands are in use. It's like crap. It like I so many great ideas are gone. So if anybody that you're bringing it back around, if anybody has a way of like, what's your favorite way of capturing those mental notes or ideas, maybe not during a performance, but even during a rehearsal, uh, so that, you know, you can keep playing, but make some kind of note that jogs your memory. Please let us know. Like this is you would. We always say, you know, we, we do the show to to help everybody, including ourselves. But this would be like, you know, maybe a way to give back to your favorite <laughs> weekend warriors that do this podcast. I would love this answer. So I would. I Yeah. If, if you've got it, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Please let us know. That would be awesome. All right. So. I have no idea what order to go in. So I'm going to go in reverse order here. Uh, the most recent thing you talked about was people that want to sit and listen. I, uh, well, I saw little feet last week um, and it was one of the shows without Paul Barrera. It was while he was uh, in the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away on Saturday, which, uh, which is very sad. I didn't, sad. I, I didn't realize I think they, did not communicate that he was as sick as it turns out he was. Um, uh, clearly. He, yeah. They had Larry Campbell and Teresa Williams opening up for them. And then Larry f f for the entire show uh, filled in on guitar and some vocals. And then Teresa came out and sang occasionally with the band. L Larry Campbell was freaking amazing. That guy is a stellar guitar player. Um, my, my, it's hard to say this now at knowing that Paul Barrera has passed away, but you know, in terms of guitar, I actually preferred him to Paul Barrera with the band. Like the, he, the way he and Fred played together, it was like, like there was some blistering stuff happening. It was really, really good. And his voice is fantastic. He's, he, you know, just as good a singer as, as Barrera. He's, he's a lead singer. So he knows how to kind of emote and, and really deliver. 
Um, unfortunately, they only had him sing a couple of tunes. They had, uh, you know, Billy Payne sang most of the leads that Barrera would have otherwise sung. And, you know, he was he's a fine singer. He's not a lead singer, right? He's he, uh, you know, for harmonies or whatever. No problem. He can hit notes. He sings in tune, all of that. He's a personable enough guy on stage, but his voice doesn't really have any personality, you know? So it was a, that part of it fell a little flat, but you know, it, it was, it was actually, it was a fully entertaining show. The thing that, that sort of brings it uh, around and, and relates it to this is, Yet again, the second time I've seen Little Feet in the last three or four years, everybody in the house wanted to sit and watch this band, mm. which just didn't make sense to me. It was really weird. Um, you know, finally toward the end, like, uh, you know, people started getting up, but not everybody. And the people that were seated were very, very heated anytime someone got up to dance. In fact, uh, we got chastised a couple times, which is fine. Um but this woman also in our row, uh, it seemed like our row, we were in the second row of the floor and it seemed like our row wanted to stand. Nobody else did, which was just a little weird. But this woman, a couple of seats down from me, this guy uh, that was behind her felt like he was uh, entitled to whack her uh, every time she stood up to dance. And she was all of five feet tall. I mean, this woman was not huge, but he, you know, he, he felt like. Uh, whacking her was the appropriate response multiple times. And, um, and he finally was escorted from the venue um, for, you know, you can't do that. But um, so I thought that was weird that little feet has little feet's crowd uh, has now become a crowd that wants to sit and listen to them, them play their music as opposed to, you know, up and moving and dancing. I don't quite I, little feet was the band that took like, you know, tight ass prog rock obsessed Dave uh, as a, you know, young 20 something and taught me that like you cannot stay still when some music is being played and we play some of that music, you know, like those guys. When I saw them early on, I think it was with Craig Fuller and Richie Hayward. Uh, well, Richie was definitely playing drums and and Craig was was singing with him. It was in that period. And it was like, oh, yeah. man, like these guys like. You can't, your feet need to move. Like what's happening? I don't, I don't, I don't know about this. I go see Rush and yes, like this doesn't happen at those shows. <laughs> so it was weird to see that, that sort of come to an end with them. So uh, I enjoyed the show. I, Lisa and I, I think I certainly, I felt this way after we left the show. I was like, I'm glad I saw them one last time, but that that's, it's okay for that to be the last time. Um, I, you know, like it's a little weird for me to go see this band and just sit and watch them. And as it turns out that, I mean, who know? I don't know what their plans are going forward, but that, that may have been my last opportunity anyway. I don't know. So, but you brought this up in the past. So I, I yeah. got to ask, is, there, is it a tendency towards the kind of more classic bands that you enjoy seeing that the audience is just getting older? And are you finding that people want to sit most of the time for most of the shows you go to, or is this a little feet specific thing? I, it, it turns out it's a little feet specific thing. I mean, I, you know, like Bar Barry Manilow it, was another show that we saw, I think around the same time we saw that last little feet show when everybody wanted to sit, but that's not entirely surprising. Like, it, you know, what was weird to me at the, at the Manilow show again, we were in the second row. It turns out uh, was that people would stand up, in between songs to applaud uh -huh. and then sit back down. And that was actually happening at the little feet show the other night. It was like, this is so weird. Like you, we, were, we saw Manilo, I think it was about two years ago, three years yeah. ago. And, um, you know, it was, it was a crowd that you would expect from Manilo. It was a little older. And, um, there were, we were on the floor about 10 rows back and one person wanted to stand up. Yeah. And had to be the person right in front of me. Right? Of course. So, <laughs> and uh, um, someone like so one row behind me actually said, Hey, could you sit down? And she said, I paid my money. I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I guess there's that, you know, I, I what do you think? I was, is, is I was raised, like I was raised, uh, you know, in, in, I mean, I've been going to see concerts for a long time. I think I saw my first show. Well, I saw weather report when I was like 10 years old. Um, and then I've been seeing shows ever since then. And I was always raised that, you know, the person in front gets to decide whether they sit or stand. And if they stand and you still want to see the band, well, then you should stand. Huh. And that, that's just I mean, that was always sort of the etiquette was, well, when the people in the front stand up, 
you might as well stand up because well, it seems like it should be a hive brain thing. It should yeah, be like it, if it you know, has become more it. that. Yes, it has become more the hive brain thing. But but it's a it's a it, it feels to me like it's become more of a um, there's a resentment there. Like to me, it was just like, well, if somebody stands up. I'm going to stand up. It's fine. You know, um, and these people around us were not. I mean, they're certainly older than they were a few years ago because that's sort of how linear time works. But they weren't, you know, they weren't in their 80s and, you know, uh, potentially not able to stand for. I mean, I, I don't know what these people's scenario was, but and mass, they were not all to the point where they couldn't stand for a couple of hours or, or yeah. an hour or whatever, you know. Um, so, yeah. I, I don't know. It just it, it it seems like I said, going to rock shows, I sort of expect that I'm going to be on my feet all night. Like that's just that's a rock show. And it and that's not necessarily the case. So anyway, there you go. You can let us know your thoughts on that too. feedback at giggabpodcast.com. You mentioned generators uh, here in New England. We play a lot of gigs on generators. <laughs> I, the generator that you're talking about that, that you, that you got to experience with this little thing. That's a consumer product and, and amazing. I have one, you know, it's, it's all of about 20 steps from where I'm sitting right here <laughs> because yeah. yeah. Cause our power goes out uh, often enough that, that we have one of these and pretty much everyone either has a portable generator, like you described, which is what we have. Uh, or, you know, a whole house generator that that runs. Usually those will run on propane, whereas the the portable ones run on gasoline and the one. And you can totally run a full band on a generator. In fact, we did it. Uh, I mentioned that that show we did uh, the Porch Fest show. We ran off a generator most recently, but we've probably okay. done a dozen shows on generators over the past few years. And the one thing I would recommend getting is a line conditioner. Not that you need it with a generator. You can certainly plug directly into the power from the generator. I'm sure that's what you did, and it works out fine. What's really handy about the line uh, conditioner is that you know what voltage you're getting out of the generator before it goes into your stuff. Because if that voltage, you're supposed to get whatever, you know, 120 or something. Um, I've seen it where it dips down to like 90 or even 80, and your gear still runs fine. At least it seems to run fine. But, you know, your power supplies are being massively overtaxed when that's happening because they're they're needing to convert and call and throw off way more heat than they normally would. And it strains them. And you do that for too long and you'll start blowing power supplies um, or and hopefully your 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 you know, your uh, circuit breakers in your in your various power supplies will trip. But some older gear doesn't have that kind of stuff, you know, so. Getting a power conditioner, uh, of, you know, just one of those. I mean, it a power conditioner is a good thing to have at every club. It cleans up the power. You can run everything through it and know that you're not going to have any grounding issues and all of that stuff. So um, I will I don't I can see Burke's power conditioner from here. I think it's a carbon one, but I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see the model number across the room. I will put it in the show notes uh, so that you can at least know which one Fling uses. And it has worked. We've run the entire band subs and everything through it, you know, no problem. So um, I will, I will put that there. So, mm. yep. Um, so I had, I had an uptown gig on that uptown gig I mentioned on Friday night. And we, we had two interesting experiences. I think they might actually be related, but I'll treat them as separate things. Um, you know, we, we've talked about these wedding gigs where, you, or in function gigs, this wasn't a wedding, but it was a, you know, it was a party at a, a, a venue, a function venue that would have weddings as well. We played weddings there and it, um, you know, you, you have to get set up. The flow of the, the show is that you get there and you know, we got there at four 30 in the afternoon. They had dinner at seven. So we were out of there by, you know, six, maybe six 30. And then we didn't play until nine. We were supposed to play at eight 15. These things never go on time. Uh, so we didn't play until nine. That was fine. That was to be expected. But it means that you have, you know, three hours to sit around and kind of wait and be impatient and probably not get food when you would want food. And so you get a little hangry and, you know, all that stuff and sitting around. Sometimes you start getting crazy ideas and that happened on Friday and we got crazy ideas about the set list. 
Uh, yep. I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. We we all took the stage collectively together, and so this was our crazy idea. Uh, but we wound up adding things. It, it turned out that these people, we didn't really know where these people found us and how they found us uh, until we got there and we were talking with them. And then it became obvious that they saw us at kind of a weird gig where we played like a big rock show. I think I talked about it. It was the, it was this gig. It was a wedding that was at a public club outside in Maine. There were a bunch of really high people there and we played a rock show. In fact, we didn't even have Kelly, our female singer at the time with us. So it was just like the guys playing a rock show. And once we realized that we're like, okay, we got to like scratch the moon dances and fly me to the moons of the world. And we need to fill the set with, you know, more upbeat, like rocking tunes. And we can get away with, some of those, you know, more harder edged rock songs like a man in the box, which actually we didn't wind up playing, but probably should have, uh, you know, those kinds of things that we might not normally do at like a wedding or a corporate party or something like that. Mm. So because of that, we started, you know, shredding the set list and we wound up with a few tunes on the set list that we had literally never played as a band together before. One song that I don't think anyone had played before. Uh, and Man, like it, so one of the tunes, it was for a group of like doctors and, and uh, staff at a, at a hospital. And so somebody had the idea that we, sh we should play um, uh, Bad Case of Loving You, Robert Palmer, which you and I have played together before. In fact, mm -hmm. as, it, as it turns out, that was the last time I played it. But mm -hmm. at least I had played it, you know, and that was 10 years ago, I think, at a Cirque du Mac party or something, maybe more. And uh that song went so well. I mean, it's a relatively easy song, but it has some of the, like the bridge thing, you know, has those tricky little progressions and stuff. We talked them through or whatever, and it went perfectly. Like the Marty sang it really well. The harmonies locked right in everybody. The groove was good. Like it was great. One of the best songs of the night. So that was good. We also played let it ride from uh, uh, Bachman Turner overdrive. I don't think anybody in the band had ever played this song. I certainly had. Why that one, though? Why, I don't know. It was it showed up on the list. We all agreed to play it. Yep. Uh, I think somebody lobbied for it. You know, it's just one of those things like, oh, this would be great. You know, no one really knew how to drive that particular bus because no one knew the form of the song. And that song has is not just like there's some there's a weird middle section to that song, I think. I don't know because we didn't really have time to research and put this all together. And, uh, and the middle of it become, you became a mushy train wreck, uh, a little bit. And finally we found ourselves back in like that verse groove. And it was like, okay, we're all together. I'm going to pull the ripcord and end this song while we're strong and everybody's playing in the same place and we're good. And we got out and it was like, okay, great. And then we played something that we knew and it, you know, it was no harm. Uh, well, it was no foul. Maybe there was harm and foul, but by the end, everybody was fine. You know, nobody cared that we butchered that particular song, but what a risky thing to do, especially at a, you know, high dollar gig. Um, mm. Yeah. It, and it, all the results of having too much time in your hands and you got it. Yep. Of, yep. Ugh. Yep. And we have other songs like we have songs that we know that we could have added. And we did add some of those like we added Van Halen's Jump, which is a song we we play occasionally, but not always. And that went over fairly well. Um, you know, so there were some things that we threw in that, you know, we, we weren't prepared to play on the set list, but we we have played before. And those all, you know, mostly went fine and, and that sort of thing. But um, but yeah, you got to watch that. Uh, that that that. Um, that idle time, man, yeah. it can be, you know, and I, I noticed this when I was on the road, whatever, 25 years ago that like I fully understood how people develop, you know, drug habits and things like that, because you're just sitting around doing nothing. And so, you, you know, you find stuff to do. Um, and, you know, especially back then, there wasn't even like, you know, social media to sort of, you know, lose your lose your face in your phone for two hours or whatever. There were no like I didn't have a cell phone when I was on the road back then. That it was just like sit around, just do nothing. So, yeah, you got to you need to you need to be aware of that idle time uh, between, you know, that is sort of baked into the schedule. So for sure. And then and, and I don't know if this factored in at all, but. We had I'll, I'll treat it as something different because it really is. It, you know, this is not the type of gig where the venue hires you. It's the type of gig where the client chooses the venue 
and also chooses, you know, the band and any other entertainment they might have and puts it all together. And so you wind up with a contract with the client and that's fine. But in this instance, the venue got started getting in the way of that. They showed up and it was late in the game. The gig was Friday. I think it was Tuesday or maybe even Wednesday that, that they showed up and, and said, Hey, we need uh, every vendor to deliver us a certificate of insurance for this particular event at this venue. Like we need to go and pay and, you know, get a special rider on the, on the band's insurance policy. If the band even has an insurance policy and, you know, go and like deliver that before we allow you to play. And at the last minute we were like, yeah, no, that's not like, nope, not, not like this. And the client sort of stepped in and told the venue back off because it, and this was a surprise to us. We've played this venue many, many times, and evidently they have some, you know, new policy or whatever there that requires them to require their vendors to, you know, eat the, whatever that is. And um, it, it was just one. Of, it's an interesting thing. You don't run into this at clubs, but it is a normal thing for contractors to have to, you know, provide proof of insurance and, yeah. and all of that. Like, that's a normal thing, but it is often overlooked in the, you know, entertainment business in at this level. But, you know, you start nudging up to the next level. Like if you were renting out, a you know, a small theater or an arena, especially an arena, like you'd have to commit to them that you're insuring the event. And uh, and so it, it's an interesting thing. And I kind of wanted to just throw out there. These are it's. It's pretty straightforward insurance. You can, you know, you, we could have gotten the policy last minute. Like it would, that would have not have been an issue at all. Basically it just requires paying for it, which I think in this one would have been about 150 bucks or something. Um, and it's possible our booking agent paid it just to make the problem go away. I think, I think that might have happened. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but uh but, you know, it, it was it is one of those things that's that's a normal part of doing business. And you may not have ever encountered it with your band, but someday you might. And yeah, yeah it's, it was just an interesting thing, especially, you know, 48, 72 hours before the, the, the show. Like, yes, this thing came together relatively quickly. You know, it was a matter of weeks, not months, but still like doesn't need to show up you know, last minute and say, Oh, by the way, we need all this stuff. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, going, going back to your thought about, um, about venues, I actually, we had that with a wedding a couple of weeks ago where we were hired to play the wedding. And yeah. obviously the people wanted us there. They chose us. Right. The venue manager was entirely indifferent. It was just another day, another wedding to them, which, you know, which is fine. Yep. But to the point of uncooperative and hostile, I don't need them to love us, but don't make our job any harder because it makes your job easier, right? I mean, right. you're still in the hospitality business, and just because we're not the customer, don't assume that the you know that the people who hired us are not going to ask how our experience was, and they did, and we told them, and it was just like you know, beautiful place, you know, nice setting, you know, food was good and all that type of stuff, but but you know, the logistics of load in, you know, they they just weren't that helpful. So you know, yeah, I, would, I as you know, it's because it's a two way street, you know, they want. Everybody should be referring everybody in, in a good situation, right? So hopefully they saw we were a good band. And if someone asked them if they need a band, you know, they would refer us. And we would like to have walked out of that situation thing. Oh, another good venue that we can that we can qualitatively refer. But they, you know, they just wouldn't help. And it's not even that we were asking them to go out of their way, just not get in our way. And, yeah. um, oh, no, know. we've that, that is un, not uncommon at, you know, at those kind of function halls. It, it, you would think, especially a place that's doing weddings regularly or, or whatever, like that they would have a very prescribed way of making sure that various types of contractors, the caterer, the band, the venue staff that's, you know, always there would not get in each other's way. Like this would to me, it would be the, the right way to just think about your logistics. It, I, I am definitely in the minority on this. You know, it is almost always that we show up at one of these things and it's like we need to you know negotiate our way around the whatever is going on at the venue and it's like you know that you're gonna have a band here like you yeah. also know you're gonna have catering you know all no, there are no surprises and yet 
we're all treating this like we're in each other's way. It's ridiculous, but it, but it is the norm. And for someone like me that like, I like efficiency and logistics and that sort of thing. It drives me crazy. I, you know, I need to like, just do my thing, keep head down, just deal with it. It'll be fine. Go play my drums, Dave bang drum, you know, Uh, (laughs) (laughs) but it, yeah, it happens all the time. It it is rare that we have somebody that's like, oh, you're the band. Well, the band parks here and loads in there. Whereas the case, it's like, nah, you know, we didn't really ever think about this. There's one tiny little staircase and we've stored all our boxes on it, but that's not a problem, right? You guys can just come up and down this with all your stuff and, and along with the caterer and everybody else. It's like, oh, sure. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about your boxes either. We'll just leave those right where they are. Yeah, no problem. We'll step over those every time <laughs> with all our crap. Uh, the life of a working musician. That's how it goes. Yep. Uh, all right. So listener Sean had a fantastic question. I think it's time, right? To talk to listener Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sean said, probably one of the most useful episodes y'all have done around conducting yourself with club owners And it was just the whole sales side of the business. I truly appreciated that. Thank you. However, I was left wondering if you had any advice on how to make the initial contact with a club. Is it better to go in person with demo or materials in hand or to send a carefully composed email with links to videos? In my experience, he says showing up usually results in them telling you to send an email. But then again, maybe I'm going there at the wrong times. Great question, Sean. Thank you for uh, for sending it in. Like we like we say all the time, we love this stuff. So I have done some of this, but we have the master here, and that is Mr. Paul Kent. So I would love hmm. to pick your brain on this, my friend. So I think it's a question of there, there's not a perfect, not every club owner is the same, right? There's not sure. a perfect attempt. I think even if the vibe has been put out there, he doesn't like it when people drop by if you have even gotten that far that you've gotten that amount of information, I think it's better, you know, to try. I think it's better to play dumb. I think it's better to, you know, and if the guy's hostile to you, you know, have your exit strategy ready. But, but I always think it's better. It takes time. You have to have your wrap down as to what you're going to do. You got to, you know, whether you're, and some of this is understanding what are your strengths? Are you a likable guy and conversational? Or is this going to be terribly uncomfortable to you no matter what you do? Be realistic about who you are in this process. Are you a salesman? Are you, you know, shy? Are you, are you, uh, have you been told that you tend to bulldoze, you know, over situations? Do a pretty good honest assessment as to who you are and then kind of get your wrap down as to how you're going to do it. But I think, you know, an innocuous flyby, introducing yourself and asking, you know, don't just give someone something that usually you know, putting something in someone's hands has now become used to be a, a, a tactic for business, hand someone a card. Yeah. They, you know, they reach out, they take it. Right. I think now that's kind of considered with all, with, uh, with all kind of digital media. I think now that's kind of considered rude, but I'm going in and saying, Hey, um, I have a band, you know, do you have a moment that I can tell you about it? And, you know, you try and find a good time to do it. I found the best time to do it was like, right before happy hour. Like, you know, that's in almost in the evening time. It's hard. They're, they're busy. They're working, but I actually find it's a little bit quieter. If you can get into a bar right when they're getting ready to open up for the evening, you know, sometimes they're busy. And if they are, again, you got to just got to be cool. You just got to be, Hey, I just want to come and introduce myself or, you know, I want to find the guy who is doing the bookings and you'll get a vibe. But when the place is empty, A, you'll be less self-conscious if there's other people over here in this conversation. Um, B, you might find the guy a little bit more focused to hear you out or give you some direction. Uh, What is your rap when you go in? And, you know, do you have stuff that's ready? Do you have a one sheet? Are you going to leave them a CD? You know, nobody really uses these types of things anymore. I think a card that has your that has your website or a picture if your band looks really good. Um, And if your band doesn't look good, your picture is not going to be an asset to you. But I think finding a time for me, it was like that 4.30-ish was not a bad time. They, they get there, they're opened up, you know, any early wanders in, people off of work, you know, it's a little bit quieter. But once once the evening gets rolling, it's a little harder to get people's attention. What are you going to say when you get in? Um, you know, how are you going to present it to people? But I, the, the, the big message is I do think 
that making a good first face-to-face impression is particularly useful more often than not. Well, so that makes sense. Yeah, he because- may get the brush off and have to go back and email or he may just say and hopefully he'll say, no, I don't do you know bands in per- person. He doesn't know that you already know that. That's cool. No. Yeah, they are right. But- they you you get you get to hear that once. And, and like once. you said, you get to, you get a pass on that. But it also makes sense, even if the person's like, uh, yeah, you know, I'm really busy. I do this all via email. Then you, your response, even if they're being a little bit gruff and curt about it, I think the right way to respond is okay. No problem. Thank you so much for your time. Like stay chipper, stay upbeat. Don't and you actually accomplish something. You now have, you know, you actually, he yeah. saw you, you right. have something to say, Hey, nice to meet you this afternoon. And, you know, to open up your email with them. I mean, you basically say as, as requested, here's some information about my band and there you go. But you're, you're, you're now one step further down yep. the line then yeah, your, your email's not coming in cold. If you found out from your friend in another band that club a doesn't like in person, they only do via email. Well, you know, you could do the cold email or you could be really friendly and respectful and get that one shot in person and then be like, Oh yeah, sorry. No problem. Hands off. You know, in, in sales, it's always the, you know, classic sales training is you put the pen down, right? Like if you're in, and it, it comes from the, the writing of the order, right? When you're writing yeah. the order, the client can be okay. Like this is real. Now you put the pen down and you back off like, Oh, Hey, no problem. Yep. No problem. I, 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 I got stuff to do today anyway. Uh, I'll shoot you an email and uh, we can, we can do it whenever you're ready. And that sort of thing. And again, so, you know, the, the smart thing about this, it is, it is a sales process. So even, even if you're going to get a cold, hard wall, maybe you have that, you already have accomplished one thing. He's seen you, yeah. he, you know, he has some connection right there. And then you get to make a decision. Totally understand. Thank you for that. I just wanted to meet you, shake your hand and let you know my name. And then you've got a little bit more recognition, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, the, the tact with which you do that. And some people are better at reading uh, uh, someone on the other side of a negotiating table than others. Some people, again, are born salespeople. They can just, you know, not take an objection and very pleasantly continue to keep a conversation in play. Some people have that skill. If it's not you, if you don't know it, you know, hopefully you have the self-awareness to figure that out. If it's not, you don't do it because, you know, you, you probably are going to create a difficult situation for yourself. Yeah. But yeah. But if, if you are the type of person just, you know, who wants to say, listen, I love your place. I've always wanted to play here. We have this amazing entertaining band, you know, that people love. And, you know, we do have a good and maybe that's it. You maybe want to give three bullets just for him to think about, you know, we've been in business for 20 years. You know, we have mail lists. We do a good job of promoting our shows and it's a really fun, entertaining show that I think would be a great fit here. I'll go home and I'll email you all the details. One, one thing in that one thing I've found in sales is is ask people what they're looking for before you tell them what you have. Right. So, you know, one thing I and I'm, I don't do a lot of this, uh, but I have found when I'm in there, oftentimes my opportunities come when I'm and like at a club that also serves food and I'm there for that you know, late lunch or uh, we, in our family, we call it dinner, you know, like, well, it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. We're sort of hungry. We've been doing chores all morning. Let's go out and get food, you know? So now you're in a, in a restaurant, you know, at a weird time of day, like, yeah. you know, the lunch crowd's over. Like you said, it's pre happy hour. It's that, it's that weird time. And, you know, you eat and you kind of get to know the staff because you might be the only people in there, or, you know, just a few people. And if I notice that a place has like, Oh, they, or if I know, then I'll ask, what kinds of entertainment do you have? Hey, you've got entertainment. Now, you're not just walking in off the street and saying, oh, looky, looky here. You've got a stage. That's amazing. What are the chances I would walk into a place with a stage? <laughs> but but if, you know, you can actually, like, support that 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 vibe, like, I'm here with my family. I'm eating. Hey, you've got a stage. I've got a band. Like, what what, what kind of entertainment do you have? And they'll tell you because... You're a patron, right? So, oh, we have some great acoustic acts or no, we have death metal every Thursday night. It's freaking amazing. You'd be surprised what this place turns into, (laughs) you know, but once they tell you, 
then you can sort of tailor your approach. Like, you know, I mean, we all, at least Paul and I have different types of bands that we play with. So if they say I've got death metal, I don't know that I have something for them, but they say, Oh yeah, we have classic rock bands in here or we have acoustic acts. It's like, Oh, okay, great. I have one of those. I don't need to tell you about the six other things I have because this is the only thing that's important. You said what you have. Now I'm going to tailor my response to you. And, and you know, how would you like me to contact you? And now we're in a conversation and I've listened to you, right? Like you listening is definitely valuable. I, I, I would respond to things. One is the probably the most valuable thing that I left out that you just plugged in. It never hurts in that first meeting for you to patronize the venue that you're you know, trying to have. You know, yeah. even if you're in there at 430, get a drink, right? Just sit at the bar, get a, even if you don't get going to finish it. At least you're now a customer and the person you're going to talk to probably is a little bit more you know, oh, a customer is about to tell me something. And yes. so hopefully they'll be in a little bit better position. So patronize the venue. There's two things. I, I assume in this conversation that it's a venue you want to play and you know about it and you know that other bands of right. your style are playing. You know, but your point about a good sales is all about opening. So asking a question and showing interest in the other person's needs is certainly a great opening technique. I I would kind of flip the you know, take that Steve Jobs approach where, you know, you don't ask people what they want. You tell them what you want, what yeah. they want. I mean, yeah. there, there's a, there's a validity to that as well. Right. Yeah, he so, made it work. You know, there's no, yeah, you can't argue with him. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point of that is, is like, you know, um, I have a product that's super. And again, I'm assuming you've done your research and, you know, you know that this venue is a good fit for you. And you know that the patrons that come there would be a good fit for you. If you walk in blind and are taken by surprise that it's a, that it's a uh, a death metal club, you know, shame on you. You've wasted everybody's time, right? Right. So do your homework in advance and, you know, figure out who it is that you want to talk to. But I do think, you know, sometimes the path is through a waitress, right? So sometimes, or a waiter. Yeah. So sometimes you're seated at a table and you just be like, hey, I know that there's entertainment here. Do you know, can you tell me who does the booking? And you might be able to get a name. You might be able to, oh, it's the manager. Often in these places, it's the manager who does 50 other things and booking the band is just a royal pain in his behind. Sometimes it's someone who takes a lot of pride in the booking. These are all little bits of information that you can kind of discern in this, in this opening process. And if you really, I guess the biggest thing with people who aren't comfortable with sales, if you view sales as from moment one, I have to hit it out of the park and, or I don't, and we're done. If you take a longer view and understand it's an incremental process of, establishing a relationship, you know, asking a question, you know, finding out if there's interest, finding out what they, what they want. If you can advance the ball. So like I said, if you walk in, even though, you know, the guy has a reputation or girl has a little reputation for, you know, only wanting things by email, you walk in and just, if they, you walk out of nothing else, you have a name and, you know, you've left a positive first impression by, you know, ex- respecting that, he, that they only want it by email. That's, a, that's moving the ball. If you can leave them with like, hey, you know, please be expecting my email. The band's name is this. And, you know, here's one thing I would want you to know about us. You've advanced the ball a little further than somebody else who hasn't done this. So many people who are uncomfortable with sales are nervous. They walk in, they spill their guts, they get shot down, and that's the end of the process. Take it a little bit of a longer view and understand that you're trying to, you're trying to move the ball down the field. Establish a connection, establish a relationship, you know, get something about your band learned by them, get something about them learned by you. That's part of establishing the relationship. Well, yeah, it, you know, I was I was at a say, well, it was I mean, it was a business development conference or whatever a couple of weeks ago. And someone was introduced as, oh, he's the head of sales for you know this company. And the guy took the stage. He's like, I really hate it. That I hate that title. He says, I, I, I prefer that I'm the head of relationships here. And it's right. It, you know, it, sales, forget about sales. You are going and developing a relationship with whoever that person is. And sometimes, like you just said, Paul, you're developing relationships with multiple people. You might make, you know, friends with the wait staff who would want to be friendly with you because you're a customer. And now you ask that person, hey, by the way, I see a bands who takes care of that. Oh, well, that's, you know, Charlotte over there. OK, great. Can you introduce me to Charlotte? You know, ask that question. People love mm-hmm. to help. Can and like one of my favorite questions to ask, because it it puts it acknowledges the power relationship in a very real way that most people don't do is to ask, Hey, can you help me? Like when someone asks me that question, the first thing I want to do is help them. 
Like, mm-hmm. we, we, I don't even know what they need for help yet. Right. You know, now if it's somebody that's abusing that over and over again, that's different. But when it's, you know, the first time that you say, hey, can you help me out? Yeah. Can you introduce me to, to <laughs> Charlotte? Like, yeah. Oh, oh, crap. Oh, now I see where we're going with this. But, you know, they there's the desire. We humans, generally speaking, we like to help each other. So ask that question. Acknowledge you, you can go in humble and come out a winner. But it's, you know, you being a winner doesn't mean anyone else loses, right? These a successful relationship in this scenario, in most scenarios, in fact, is I like to say a non zero sum game. Like it doesn't have to be that there's, you know, one winner and one loser. In fact, there should be two winners here. You know, if your band is the right kind of thing, you've solved a problem for them because they need to have a band on every Friday and Saturday night. So now you've just plugged in six dates a year for them or 12 dates, a year, whatever that is, you know, you can be that person and they've solved a problem for you because you don't want to sit at home 12 days a year. You want to be out playing your music. So this is a win. And assuming you're the right kind of band for the room, then it truly is a win. So yeah, thinking about it that way, like I'm just going and saying hello to someone. And and it's just a relationship and some relationships aren't going to work out. You know, I always say sales is a game rooted in negativity. If you ask mm-hmm. 20 people if they want to buy from you and 19 say no, that is success because you you need to sell, but you don't need to sell yeah. to everybody. So just remember that. You and won't sell to everybody. You will not. If your goal is that it needs to be 19 yeses out of 20 questions, you, you, it's like you, you go to Vegas. You go, yeah, yeah, don't, don't, but don't, because you're also going to fail there. <laughs> yeah, that's you're lucky if you win once out of every nineteen, and once out of every twenty in Vegas. But yeah, yeah, no, it, it's um. So hopefully that helps. I, your, I'm glad to hear you name. say that that the your advice of meeting the person in person is is still valid in today's world. That that that's good advice. I like that. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, it's good. Good stuff, Dave. Yeah. Do we have anything else or are we, uh, I think we're, I think we've hit it for today. I got to get to my coffee with my, with my new band buddy. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, maybe go with like jeans and not the kimono though. I think that might be a better. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Well, that's the end of that folks. We will, uh, we'll see you next week. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Make sure to, uh, make sure to, you know, tell us what you want to tell us what you want us to talk about. Ask us. Tell us what we're wrong And always, 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 even when you're meeting the bartender for the first time, always be performing. <laughs> <laughs>